Benvenuti a tutti and welcome everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Vittorio Calabrese and I'm the director of Magazzino Italian Art. We're happy to have you with us uh, today to launch uh, our brand new program, Pensiero Plurale. And I would like to thank both the filmmaker Fred Kurnu and uh, the series curator Ilaria Conti for inaugurating uh, this new initiative. Pensiero Plurale is a new series of programs that will explore diversity in culture and the arts from a multidisciplinary perspective involving artists, scholars, and cultural practitioners. practitioners. This initiative will unfold over the next three years and will aim to shed lights on shared questions and critical approaches across Italy and the United States. While today the format of this conversation is, of course, digital, we hope to host uh, future programs in person. Uh, though we're not together, we know that, that uh, in today's conversation, we know that today's conversation is uh, interactive. I invite you, we invite you to ask questions throughout the conversation us using the chat feature that you see under this page. Um, at this point, I will leave you with Ilaria and Fred to start a conversation. And for a brief introduction, I wanna, uh, I wanna say a few words about Ilaria. Ilaria is an independent curator whose work focuses on research-based uh, practices engaging with system of power, decolonial epistemologies, and the relationship between institutional infrastructure, commercial, communal care, and civic agency. We will be collaborating with Ilaria, as she's the curator of Pensiero Plurale for the next, uh, hope, hopefully, several years. Uh, but most recently, um, she served as research curator at the Saint Pompidou for Cosmopolis, a multi-year platform devoted to research-based art. Previously, she served as exhibition and program director at CIMA, uh, the Center for Italian Modern Art here in New York. She was also assistant curator of the 2016 Marrakesh Biennale and uh, the Samuel H. Crest Interpretive Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I do also want to mention for whoever is in uh, Italy right now, that uh, she was also the curator of an exhibition named, uh, titled Prove di Riesistenza uh, that is currently on view uh, through February 19 at the Fondazione Baruchello in Rome. Thank you and on to you, Ilaria and Fred. Thank you for uh, your time and for accepting our invite. Uh, I'll leave it to you, bye. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank you, Vittorio, for this. And I want to thank George and Nancy, all the Magazzino staff, Juliet, Carolina, for this collaboration. And I want to thank also those who are watching this for their voting their time to this event and these topics. Um, for me, it is very exciting to inaugurate this new project, which, as Vittorio mentioned, is the first in a multi-year series scattered under the title of Pensiero Plurale, Plural Thinking. And this is exactly what we set ourselves to do through this series, to reflect on issues of diversity, of plurality of thinking, um, on issues that are urgent and central to our societies, but also, and most importantly, to do so in intersectional ways, which means to look at them uh, by way of transversal, multidisciplinary approaches and um, through the direct voices and the work of cultural practitioners. Um, through this process, we want to explore resonances and the specificities across Italy and the United States and um, elements that really could help us gain deeper insight on these topics and rethink them communally, which is uh, what we're trying to do also here tonight. And we do so, we want to do so, because we are, of course, aware of how important it is to foster this type of conversation through the arts, but um, especially we know also how much um, work there is still to do. So um, I feel it is very important to mention that we're launching this series during Black History Month, which is an initiative that is finally gaining attention in Italy as well, through, thanks to the work of many activists and cultural practitioners like Fred, uh, but also organizations, some of which Fred might address, uh, I'm not sure, such as um, Black History Month Florence, just to name one among many. So most importantly, I feel it is meaningful to begin this series with Fred and Fred's work, uh, because this gives us the chance to learn, to think, discuss how representation has to shift in cultural arenas, in popular and visual culture, in our collective Im imaginary, 
because this is also a, a repository of collective knowledge for all of us. So thank you, Fred, for being open to sharing your knowledge and your practice with us. For those who might not be familiar uh, with Fred's practice, he's a filmmaker and scholar who has been working on Afro-descendant representation and social justice issues in the context of Italy and beyond through documentaries such as Inside Buffalo, 18 New Soli, and of course, Black Spo Italian, 100 Years of Blackness in Italian Cinema, which he will address tonight, but also um, is a documentary that can be watched until the end of today um, on um, Magazzino's website in the Magazzino da Casa section. So Fred, I will leave it to you. And again, as Thank we you. Did, I just want to encourage everyone in the meantime to ask questions in the comment section of the live stream so that we can gather them and then pass them on to you in the Q&A phase, which will be in 30 to 40 minutes. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, uh, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to make a conversation with you and with the audience. So don't be shy to uh, ask question or to write statement uh, in the chat in every time of this conversation. And at the end, maybe in the next 35 minutes, uh, uh, we will start also a Q and A and conversation uh, uh, with all the audience. And I'm very excited that this is my first time that uh, I'm giving uh, this uh, uh, event online talk uh, that is called uh, Black It, uh, representing blackness in Italy. Black It uh, actually is uh, a concept, a multi-platform concept that I'm develop uh, through different media, so through talks and conversation, uh, through a web doc series uh, and. Uh, it will be also uh, next year, we are in preparation, uh, a feature documentary and also maybe a book. So hopefully uh, this uh, uh, inauguration of tonight uh, will be very important uh, uh, also to test. So I hope you will enjoy uh, the version of the event and hopefully when everything uh, finished, the emergency of COVID will be restored, we will be able to bring also COVID in, uh, sorry, we will be able to bring the black in your city. Um, why I'm doing uh, uh, this work? Uh, I'm really excited, uh, uh, especially uh, since uh, a couple of years, to understand uh, much more better the trajectory of uh, my career and the trajectory, of course, also of my life. So, rethinking right now when uh, I was a kid, when I was a child, if I never believed to become a filmmaker or doing something more for my uh, community, it's very strange, but I made uh, some weeks ago this uh, exercise uh, to try to reconnect uh, inside uh, my life uh, uh, some key moments of my life uh, in which uh, I understood that uh, uh, I felt uh, uh, something to tell and maybe I, said, I felt also that uh, there were difference in the society. Uh, as a matter of fact, that one of my motto is uh, tell your own story before others tell it for you. This is uh, uh, something that uh, I always say in every kind of engagement that I have, in particular with young students in college or university, but also with uh, uh, underrepresented minorities and communities uh, in the society. And I think that uh, minorities and uh, underrepresented communities uh, needed absolutely to have the control so to take also the control of their own story and the storytelling of their own story. So this is one of my uh, mission in uh, my current career. And we go every time during this talk, we will go very often back and forth with many clips. Some uh, clips are produced uh, uh, personally by me, other are clips that I will try to edit for um, this talk to bring you into uh, this representation of blackness in Italy to be, bring you also in different time. So we will talk something uh, around the past. We will talk about something that is uh, currently living by uh, uh, black Italians right now. And maybe we will also try to design something on the future. But I want to start with the past. So I want to start uh, uh, with my story or a partially a part of my story. Uh, I was born uh, in Bologna. I was born and raised in Bologna. And of course, I'm African descent.
This is my father. Uh, he is uh, a Ghanaian uh, doctor. He came to Italy in 1965 uh, to study medicine and then he met uh, my mom in Italy. I was born in the early 70s, uh, but since I was born and I was a kid, uh, I started uh, to ask uh, questions, especially at the time in which uh, uh, when I was outside with my mom uh, in the neighborhood of Bologna, uh, a person asked to my mom uh, if I was adopted and uh, she also tell, uh, told to my mom uh, you are so kind to have adopted not one but two kids, African kids, because I have a sister of course. Uh, and so for many reasons I felt uh, the only one in the room when I was at the high school, when I was uh, at elementary school, when I was uh, uh, at the university too, and when I was also starting my career in uh, public television in Italy. I felt the one, uh, only one African descent, of course, in the room until uh, I, I had this great opportunity in the past to work uh, in a movie by Spike Lee called uh, Miracle at Santana. And Spike uh, inspired me in doing a lot of things uh, about uh, my community. And of course, I was really uh, a fan of him and particularly of the film Do the Right Films. Do the Right Films is a, a great, Do, Do the Right Films is the name of my company production that inspired from this great film, Do the Writing. And Do the Writing is a great film to understand much more about race relations in a community, in a city, or in a nation. A speech that in Italy is very difficult. So in, uh, in Italy, it's very difficult to address uh, racist uh, uh, and multi ethnicity uh, talk uh, because uh, there is this uh, fear to analyze if race uh, and uh, race. Uh, uh, relation uh, are addressed in our country, especially in, in Italy. And one of the work uh, that I'm basically bringing since a decade uh, is reporting uh, many things about uh, blackness in Italy, because uh, uh, while the story of uh, African Americans, Afro Brazilian, in some cases in Europe about uh, black British or uh, Black French uh, uh, have, in one sense, uh, a media cycle or education cycle, and so there is a networking of knowledge about that. Uh, unfortunately, many stories of Southern Europe, including uh, Italy, about Black Italians are not addressed or not reported in any media cycle, in any media or education cycle. Uh, sometimes are reported abroad. So for uh, the audience, uh, for example, were living in the United States, uh, uh, I found uh, more uh, stories uh, and uh, more academic also knowledge about uh, Afro-Italians uh, abroad Italy than in Italy. And so this is uh, uh, something that we want to uh, fill uh, with also my project, but also with other uh, people who are involved in, in bringing Black culture in Italy, in particular with my project uh, Black, Black It uh, two years ago. Uh, Blackit is not only a web doc series, it's a multi-platform, but there is also a part connected to producing video clip of uh, mm. history. And in particular, two years ago, I decided to bring uh, some pieces of uh, uh, Black Italian history. Why? Because uh, there is this assumption that uh, African descent came just only in the last 25 years, 30 or 40 years, uh, uh, as immigrant uh, in Italy. Someone also know maybe the relation between uh, colonialism of uh, the last millennium, the last century, uh, but it's very difficult uh, reading also the controversy that uh, we read every time on social media when there is maybe an historical production. And so today we will talk also about media representation and video production. For example, uh, some weeks ago, there was a controversy not in UK, was a global controversy, but was also in Italy about uh, a project, a product called The Bridgerton. It's a Netflix series in which uh, uh, a queen, a British queen, has portrayed uh, a mixed race. And also there is uh, the daily life uh, of uh, uh, the kingdom. And in, the, in this daily life, there are a lot of uh, Black British who are a part of uh, the story of The Bridgerton. And this was a, a huge controversy also in the Italian social media because many people start to assume that uh, black person, black people were not uh, uh, present in the uh, United Kingdom at the time. We are talking about the end of the 19th century. And even they are present, maybe they assume they were only slaves and so were not allowed them to be in an important uh, king palace or whatever. 
And of course, uh, we are here also to demonstrate that this assumption are uh, totally wrong because uh, there were a lot of presence uh, of African descent presence, not only in the kingdom, but also in Italy since the Roman Empire before also the slavery, and there were also uh, presence after the slavery. So for this reason, I produce this clip uh, in which uh, I will try to uh, basically uh, bring into the conversation uh, with a visual image uh, some of the figure, and maybe were the most important, but uh, doesn't mean that there were not other figure that are a part of uh, the African descent Italian history. Not the only one uh, doing uh, this project in Italy. There are a lot of uh, artists, uh, scholars who are trying uh, to uh, bring to the attention of uh, the Italian education cycle, but also to the media or the institution uh, um, experience and stories connected with blackness in Italy. An important person in Italy, an artist that uh, I really appreciate his work, but is also a scholar and educator, is Justin Randolph Thompson that is uh, the producer of Black History Month of Florence and uh, with uh, the Uffizi Gallery they release a great project for example in which they are telling the stories uh, uh, behind the uh, important uh, figure of uh, the Renaissance and important uh, uh, Black uh, uh, African descent who were portrayed uh, in the past and uh, which uh, uh, great uh, uh, description of uh, the stories behind. In some cases, of course, are stories uh, of uh, servants or slaves, but in other cases are also story of people uh, who came uh, to visit uh, uh, the important or different kingdom that uh, there were in Italy. So we're not only slaves or servants. Representing blackness in Italy. And this is very important to, uh, to explain also another concept that uh, uh, we had this kind of representation and uh, uh, another great work, uh, for example, in literature 
is a work made by Ijaba Shego and uh, to create the connection, uh, for example, with the monument uh, and uh, the presence uh, of uh, colonialism uh, uh, celebration or signs, uh, especially in the city of Rome. And there are, of course, uh, uh, work that uh, in this moment uh, are connected with a contemporary visual artist or rappers or creators in general, because our connection and our experience, I think, is circular. And so we can maybe work on a clip like I made a couple of years ago, and then this clip can transform and inspire another artist in another discipline to create something else. Uh, to create this sense, of course, of connection with uh, the message. Um, so if Italy has this kind of experience, that basically is a multi-ethnic experience uh, until uh, a lot of centuries since the Roman Empire, so uh, the connection between uh, Africa, uh, the king of Axum, the kingdom of ancient Egypt, and also if we trace in the history um, also voyages, uh, travels of Africans uh, in Italy, like for example, uh, Ethiopia pilgrims were uh, hosted by Pope Sixtus IV in uh, the 16th century in the Vatican, and they opened a church called uh, San Stefano degli Abissini uh, to celebrate the presence of uh, the Ethiopian priest and pilgrim in, in Italy. When Italy started, uh, this is the question, to uh, define themselves itself and to represent itself, uh, only as a white nation and all allowed the other question very important is also when uh, this representation with a lot of negative stereotypes uh, a lot of uh, racialization and a lot of course uh, of uh, racism uh, came if the experience of the country is a uh, multi-ethnic experience in the experience that started of course uh, uh, with a process of, of the unification of italy this was a process that uh, uh, happened in the end of the 19th century. It is a process in which, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the political idea was to create uh, a nation uh, much more homogeneous uh, because Italy at the time was uh, formed by different kingdoms and actually the process of unification was a, pro a process of annexation of uh, a kingdom, uh, the kingdom of uh, the two Sicily, primarily in the south, uh, that was uh, uh, included in the Kingdom of Piemonte and then in the Kingdom of Italy. During this process, uh, and I will be very brief, uh, there were a lot of uh, episodes in which uh, uh, scientists like Lombroso and Nicephoro uh, basically create uh, the scientific racism also in Italy. Uh, scientific racism was just uh, uh, present in Europe, especially the uh, United Kingdom and in France with other scientists. Uh, uh, who celebrate and declare the superiority of uh, the white race. So they started to talk about race and then also to talk about the relation between races uh, and in particular the fact that uh, the white race was the uh, race uh, that uh, being superior uh, was in one sense uh, excused uh, to bring uh, civilization. This was one of the metaphor uh, into the colonial empire. And so at the time, uh, and I skip uh, to the uh, early years of the 20th century, uh, so after the first uh, invasion of Ethiopia that has been made uh, by the kingdom, uh, and the most important invasion of Ethiopia has been made uh, during also the Mussolini and the fascist regime time. And during this time, starting from the 1920, of course, uh, the media propaganda uh, was really strong uh, to uh, represent uh, blackness and particularly uh, African and particularly also Ethiopian as uh, inferior and was very, very uh, focused uh, to represent also in, uh, in a specific way also the, the black body of the black women. Uh, and this representation, and this is a part of uh, my work, uh, uh, it's uh, a sort uh, of, uh, I don't want to say inspiration, but uh, it's an inspiration that uh, will not uh, and very soon in Italy, and definitely didn't end after the end of uh, uh, World War II and the end of the fascist regime, because of course uh, uh, it was uh, uh, issues of culture, but also education. So there was a representation, and I want to show you something about uh, the representation of the time, that was uh, in everything, was in the advertisement, was in the media, was in the film, uh, was uh, in the school book, uh, it was in the radio. Uh, 
and of course there were officially magazine uh, uh, to promote uh, the concept of the racism and also there was uh, uh, the concept of the Black Venus that has a longer pedigree that start in the literature and this was a concept uh, for example I make a citation of uh, the writer Filippo Marinetti that described Africa uh, with uh, sexual uh, allusion and so the possession of black women bodies uh, uh, was uh, conceded with the conquest of the colonial territory, like the empire of the colonies was a, a virgin territory. And so there were a lot of metaphor inside every kind of uh, advertisement, and uh, in particular uh, targeting uh, the black women. And this kind of um, advertisement actually never changed also in the 70s, uh, you have seen, uh, some of you, I hope, have had the opportunity to see Black Spoitalia on my documentary in which I interview and I told the story of the Black Venus. Uh, and the story of the Black Venus, uh, we can find many uh, seeds of uh, this culture also in uh, the cultural creation of Italy of the 70s or the 80s uh, in terms of films, uh, like the films with uh, Zeo Di Araya, Ines Pellegrini, for example, but also in terms of advertisement. I share uh, before a picture of uh, a dessert uh, company uh, with uh, the slogan Pensiero Stupendo. The same happened, of course, in the kids' culture. So these are uh, books or school books uh, of the time or uh, cartoon books for kids uh, in which uh, uh, propaganda and racist propaganda was uh, uh, was filled in every in every part of uh, uh, the media representation of blackness at the time and so we can understand that why maybe in the 70s 80s uh, people who were 60s or 70s were just kids during this time and were people that they were educated to think uh, uh, at the black body as uh, someone inferior, uh, someone to civilize uh, or someone uh, to uh, represent uh, uh, with stereotypes. Uh, and this is also the story, I don't want to create controversy today, but this is also the story why uh, also nowadays in some uh, art title of the article, for example, we have uh, uh, this article in which uh, uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, uh, has been named Mulatta. Mulatta is a term uh, to say mixed race, uh, but came from uh, a Portuguese word, uh, and the Portuguese uh, use uh, mulatto to say a mixed race person that is like a mulo, so like a donkey, because the donkey is a mix between uh, two different animals. And the use of this language is uh, sometimes uh, uh, used not uh, to art people or with the intention to art, but is definitely used without knowing the meanings of many things that are connected with uh, uh, the Italian history. And maybe it was not a name used <laughs> during the Renaissance uh, or during the Roman Empire to define uh, people of uh, different ethnicity. And at the time, there were a lot of people with different ethnicity. So this is the kind of the representation that happened, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, in the past and happened for, for many years. But now I want to share with you and to talk about the new generation. And so uh, the shifting between being represented by others to start to represent it ourselves. And I put also me inside uh, this uh, scenario. Um, this uh, evolution, it's uh, connected also to evolution of the sense of belonging to being Black in Italian Italy, and also with the term. So many years ago, for example, it was really popular using it to refer to an African descent uh, uh, born or raised in Italy, uh, the word in Italian, Italo Africano, so like Italian African. Uh, then, in the last uh, maybe 10 years, uh, with uh, the explosion of a lot of community blog uh, hosted and created by young Black Italians, uh, uh, there is a sort of shifting also in the term. And so many people uh, think so or want to define as Afro Italian or Black Italian. And also I give you just a few highlights, the community, the black community in Italy, it's not real, uh, it's homogeneous because uh, we are Italian, but if we're talking about uh, our background and roots, it's not homogeneous like country like United States, uh, in which maybe the 75% uh, of um, uh, black American are African American, and then there are a lot of uh, people that came from different parts of Africa and Caribbean. It's not the same experience of Brazil or France or uh, United Kingdom, where, for example, 
the 70% of the Black British uh, have a background from uh, farmer British colonies, and particularly West Africa. Um, the composition of the Black Italy, it's uh, real uh, diverse. So there are people who came from all of parts of Africa, so it's not necessarily from the farmer Italian colonies, but also from uh, West Africa. It's a matter of fact that the most uh, relevant community in Italy are the people originally from Senegal, Ghana, and Nigeria, but also there are a lot of people who came from Brazil, South America. There are a lot of kids who were adopted uh, in the past. And in particular, we use this uh, word, the generation Ballotelli, to talk about the generation born in the 90s, in the time in which there is a demographic explosion of uh, uh, people with, uh, and kids, of course, uh, with an African uh, background. This generation is the generation that uh, in the last four or five years are using uh, a lot the social media and they are using consciously. And social media are using uh, uh, and are becoming also for them a way not only to express their identity, but to define uh, the issues of uh, this generation and also to try to make a resistant and a counter alternative storytelling of being Black in Italy. And one of the most important role, I think, and I'm really sure, and I bring their example in many talks that I'm doing in university, are uh, Black Italian women, in particular, a lot of blogs that. Uh, they launched uh, in the last year as a blogger activist, uh, and uh, I'm sharing some uh, names like uh, Bella Mia Grazia. Uh, later on, I will share also a, a small clip about uh, about them. Siamo entrambe rese conti di avere questa frustrazione in comune di essere italiane ma di non essere considerate italiane e di non vederci rappresentati in nessun modo e quindi abbiamo iniziato. Uh, abbiamo deciso insieme di colmare questo vuoto. L'africano non è quello che è mostrato nei TG o comunque nelle varie trasmissioni. Le nostre telefonate di tipo due ore. <ride> Una volta ho detto, oh, cavoli, ma perché non fondiamo una piattaforma, un blog sì. dove eh, finalmente possiamo iniziare a costruire la realtà che abbiamo sempre voluto vedere esatto. crescendo. La cosa bella di Africa del Sol, secondo me, è che non parliamo della, soltanto del, del, delle discriminazioni, delle non cadiamo nel vittimismo. Ma mostriamo anche per dire che outfit potresti avere, che make-up potresti indossare, i capelli, Uh, via con uh, natural hair, ma non solo. This is only just one of uh, the a lot of blogs that we have, a lot of websites. Another one is Evelyn with Nap Italian Girls. Uh, uh, and so in this part of the talk, I want also to, to show some example of representation, counter narrative, uh, but at the same time, uh, cultural diversity. Uh, creativity work that a lot of people are doing, like for example Tamara Pizzoli. I showed you before uh, the clip uh, uh, about the comic book with the representation made for African descent during the fascist time. Uh, for example, uh, Tamara is bringing. <laughs> a new way also to bring uh, um, um, story for kids, uh, uh, African descent, uh, and so she, she decided to publish a lot of uh, kids' book. Actually, our book that are also used for her English school. Tamara Pizzoli, uh, was born and raised in the United States. She moved to Italy uh, 10 years ago. She has four kids and the reason why uh, she's not only managing an English school, uh, but the reason why she wants to bring diversity and blackness inside uh, the storytelling of the young Italians are really important. For example, this is a, a novel called Talula and Talula has been inspired by an Italian Dominica actress, uh, Iris Peinado. Iris Peinado was one of the actors that uh, probably if you have uh, seen uh, the documentary Black Italian, 
she is one of the interviewer, but she was a great actress of the 80s. Uh, she worked in the film with Massimo Troisi and Roberto Benigni, Non ci resta che piangere. And so the work of Tamara Pizzoli is really relevant uh, uh, inside a particular segment that is the education. But also I want to show you another uh, clip that is very important and it's very nice uh, because it's uh, a work that uh, are doing uh, uh, visual artists. Uh, uh, of course, I'm not uh, an art history um, uh, professor or expert, but I really find uh, interesting uh, this work and also I really find interesting uh, uh, the work that uh, uh, a scholar of Florida State University, Tele Beek, and also a collaborator of a magazine uh, um, art museum uh, made uh, with an article talking about one or two of uh, these uh, three artists that I want to show you. Blackie, representing blackness in Italy. One of these artists is Luigi, Chris Maggetti. And this is a great artist because uh, uh, Luis Chris Vegetti, he was born in North Italy and uh, he's uh, really trying to work in particular representing the black uh, woman. And so usually his paints uh, are inspired by personality. In this case, uh, Tessa Abrams is uh, an Italian actress uh, and uh, he created also an important uh, solo show, some. Uh, a month ago uh, called uh, Sotopelle. So this is a great uh, work uh, to try to re represent uh, the black woman body, um, especially trying to bring to the attention of a different segment of the society and also the art gallery or the museum, uh, uh, the black presence in Italy, but also the presence of uh, contemporary visual artists. Uh, and having contemporary visual artists, uh, uh, it's a process uh, very difficult because of course, uh, uh, the generation Balotelli is a generation that attended a uh, different kind of school. Only now we are assisting uh, the effect of those uh, who were to study fine arts uh, and those who have also the opportunity and possibility to have a studio to work and, uh, and so, so to express. Attraverso il mio lavoro cerco di rivendicare quello che sono e quello che sono tutte queste, tutti questi giovani italiani, afrodiscendenti, non riconosciuti dallo Stato, non riconosciuti dalla nazione. Nuove modalità di resistenza. New way of resistance. This is uh, Binta Dio. Binta Dio has Senegal roots, so is, uh, she is Italian Senegalese and uh, she is a visual artist. Uh, she is doing a lot of installation, but she is very focused on primarily two uh, topics uh, that are very important for uh, the black Italian youth, uh, the citizenship, because unfortunately um, not all uh, the people born in Italy by immigrants are immediately Italian citizens. Tratto fatomi dal pittore Giulio Frigo. La mia immagine si moltiplica e si deforma tante volte quanto sono le micro lenti applicate sul vetro della cornice. Restituisce un'identità gassosa, diffusa e granulare, che prolifica come le miliardi di goccioline che costituiscono quella specie di cose sfocate. Che and this is a project that came uh, last uh, Black History Month, so last February. Uh, it's a project in collaboration with uh, Vogue Italy, in, with, uh, in which the artist Gian Perrucchini celebrated the figures of Afro Italia, like the boxer, for example, Leone Iacovacci, that was a mixed race uh, boxer who became champion, European champion, Italian champion in the 20s in Italy, or the story of uh, the first black aviator in the world, uh, the Italian Eritrean captain uh, Domenico Mondelli, uh, that after, was, uh, after that was exonerated by the fascists, or the story of uh, Bikita, and a lot of story. This is a, a partisan, uh, his name is Sinigalia, and was actually Afro-Italian Jewish uh, uh, descendant uh, parties and, and this is Jan Perucchi. So basically it's the work also to uh, try to explain uh, that uh, the African presence, the African descent presence in Italy came since a lot of time. So it's a presence that uh, we can trace uh, since uh, the Roman Empire. Roman Empire, sorry. Another great uh, artist, uh, and uh, we will open also the chapter in a few seconds of the people who are abroad Italy, so the black Italians who are not living anymore in Italy. I'm born in Rome, my mother is Puerto Rican, my father is Italian, 
Sono cresciuta a Roma negli anni... Praticamente sono nata negli anni 70 e sono... She's born in Kangallo, she lives in uh, New York, in Bronx, uh, and basically she was born and raised in Rome, and then she moved uh, uh, to United States. And uh, she's also a professor at the Pratt Institute, uh, but she's a, a really well-known uh, artist. She's working with uh, uh, recycled materials, and she's bringing high identity in Africa, and the same identity, in particular also the Caribbean part uh, of being uh, uh, Afro-Italiano, Afro-Italian, because we have a lot of people that uh, have also backgrounds from, especially in Republic, Dominican Republic in Italy, or in some cases when we talk about South America from, uh, from Brazil. Um, so there is a sort of, again, a circularity between uh, subject and ideas. Uh, and is a matter of fact that another important presence in Italy are from uh, also Afro African American uh, who settled in Italy to open their company. Uh, one of the most important cases is the company of White, uh, and uh, founded by the fashion designer uh, Virgil Abloh, that is also the artistic director of uh, Louis Vuitton. He decided to open his brand in Italy. We have Stella Jeanne, and actually in the last week Stella launched an initiative reported also by the BBC about the black slide metal in Italian fashion. She worked in the past with Armani, but now she's managing her uh, own brand and uh, she's very popular. And it's a matter of fact that uh, not only in 2020, but also the next uh, Milan Fashion Week, uh, I think in the next day we lost a digital event uh, uh, just to promote uh, black, desi black designer in uh, the Italian industry and in particular Afro-Italian designer. Even in Italy we have not only African-American like uh, uh, Virgil Abloh but also um, the presence of Iran Priston or uh, the founder of Samsung 6 uh, uh, and also we have an interesting uh, um, collaboration uh, with uh, a writer, Jordan Anderson. He was one of the most writers of Vogue Italy and many other books and, uh, and uh, of course uh, journals and he launched recently a project supporting uh, in something about the black Italian culture and uh, environment and in particular this is a project that connected the black Italian queers experience. So this is another uh, things that uh, create, uh, like uh, Virgil Abloh said uh, in, in, a, in an interview, creativity is uh, sometimes is a problem solver because you are not working on a specific discipline, but you can uh, interact with different uh, topics uh, and disciplines uh, and put your idea and so maybe create something different that can be shared, of course, by uh, other person. And I try to to go really fast. So basically we will end uh, the first part of the event uh, talking about the media. Uh, talking about the media is my work. Uh, I made a documentary about that. Uh, and many things are changing also in uh, the new arena of uh, um, the media representation of blackness, uh, even and we have still problem in the representation produced, most of the film produced uh, by of course, uh, uh, the public funds uh, uh, or uh, many things that are produced by the public channel. But also in this case, uh, a part of uh, uh, American companies who have their branches in Italy, like uh, Netflix or Amazon Italy, are portraying in a different way the generation of Black Italians. And in particular, we have two important projects, and I want to share with you one. It's called The Summertime. It's a series of Netflix. They are producing the second season right now. So. It's a very well-known season, and uh, the main important uh, character is a, a black Italian girl. Senti, ma tu di dove sei? Di qui. No, di dove sei esattamente? Io sono nata e cresciuta qui esattamente. Ok, no, te lo sto chiedendo. Perché sono nera? No. No. Te lo sto chiedendo perché non sono di qua. Non me ne ero accorta. Sente. Mm, un pochino. Ma come parlo? Sì. And in this series is very important because uh, uh, the, the actress uh, 
Coco Goamba is not only the protagonist of the series, but also there is this scene that is very important because uh, it's a sort of, of uh, first time in which uh, they want to explain that they are Italians. Because in many uh, TV shows uh, or films, uh, always uh, the black body, I, I tell this story and also I imagine that uh, those who, of you who have the opportunity to watch Black Spot Italian, they understood uh, you need always to contextualize a black body into a film. So the, the, you need to have a sub story why a black body is in the film, if he's an immigrant, uh, if he's adopted uh, or whatever. There is not still the assumption that uh, if you see diverse faces, uh, or ethnicity, they are just Italian. And so for this reason, this series is very important. Another this series very important, another creator, uh, young uh, Afro-Italian is Antonio Di Cale di Stefano. He became really popular and famous publishing uh, uh, four books. Uh, the first book was self-published by him uh, and was promoted only using the social media and then it became uh, and, and it was picked up by Mondadori, the most important publisher. Antonio was also behind the scene uh, to create another great music project that is the Gali project, the Gali music project, uh, but also Netflix announced that uh, they will release uh, and actually they finished uh, to shoot uh, uh, the series uh, last summer and next April will be released uh, the first series in which uh, the main uh, protagonists are only black Italian actors and this is another great achievement to portray in a different way uh, Afro-Italians. Mi chiamo Antonio Di Credi Stefano, ho 27 anni e sono uno scrittore. I miei genitori vengono dall'Angola, ma io sono nato vicino a Varese. Quattro anni fa ho iniziato a scrivere e raccontare il mondo che mi circondava e non sono più riuscito a smettere. Sto scrivendo una serie per Netflix, prende spunto dei personaggi e dell'ambientazione del mio ultimo libro non ho mai avuto la mia età, ma il progetto seriale ha preso un'altra strada rispetto a quella del romanzo. Zero è la storia di un ragazzo speciale, di un ragazzo nero, che ha un super potere, grazie al quale può conoscere la realtà delle cose, delle relazioni e delle persone che si nasconde sempre dietro le apparenze. Per me, per un ragazzo nero italiano come Zero, che deve tutto all'Italia, la cosa più bella è che questa sarà la prima serie nella quale i protagonisti saranno dei ragazzi neri italiani. Spero che questo possa aprire una porta a quegli attori, creativi e artisti neri che non hanno ancora avuto un'occasione importante. Spero che questa storia rifletta quella di tanti ragazzi, a prescindere dal loro colore. Ci sarà tanto rap, perché il rap è la lingua della mia generazione. Zero uscirà nel 2020. Spero che vi piaccia. Representing uh, any example, any um, inspiration, a role model, Afro-Italian, this is a great time to celebrate uh, uh, a new starting of uh, uh, a generation of uh, African descent uh, uh, in Italy. So I hope that you will join this uh, conversation and uh, uh, with uh, Ilaria and also the audience, uh, uh, we can uh, chat together until the end of the event. Thank you so much. Fred, thank you so much for this. This was a great sort of panoramic view and you brought up a lot of important issues, pivotal points. As, as Fred said, I encourage everybody to start asking questions in the comment section of the live stream so that we can um, pass them on then to sure. Fred. In the meantime, though, I wanted to uh, get this conversation started somewhat or extend some of the elements that you've been discussing precisely from where you ended right now. Um, you, in uh, Blackspo Italian, you mentioned at the beginning, quite at the beginning uh, of the documentary, something that resonated and stayed with me very much, which is um, that um, you realized uh, you had this sort of internal voice that told you that you had been absent from your own imagination since you were born. So that somewhat, that was not there in the way in which you saw yourself and you saw um, yourself reflected in the media. So I wanted just to ask you whether you could talk to us, for those who might not know you, um, if you could talk to us a little bit more about your process and some of the key challenges as a filmmaker, director, and in um, sort of going about the responsibility of being in the position 
of structuring the narrative, structuring also the language, since you were talking about language before, no? By being behind cameras, uh, structuring the overall narrative, but also choosing who gets to be in front of it. And so who gets to have ultimately a voice besides you or sort of weaving your voice with that of others. So some elements of your process, how you've been working through these responsibility and also some of the key challenges perhaps you've encountered while trying to do so. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I bring uh, into my artistic um, element of my career and work uh, my past experience of DJ. So sometimes I, 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 I think that I'm using uh, uh, interview music uh, stories like uh, you are doing a playlist, uh, a playlist of a radio show that is uh, an hour long, and uh, and at the end of the hour. Uh, all the elements are, of course, uh, really great mixed, uh, but also there is uh, the sensation to have something, to have uh, to have uh, achieved something during this hour. Uh, this is only my uh, artistic part of my work because actually I don't define me as a or an artist uh, or an artistic in, in the sense of uh, uh, creator, uh, but. Um, there is a, uh, the 70% of my work is just uh, much more meticulous uh, um, reading a historical report when it's a, an historical documentary or reading a lot of things when it's a current uh, social issue documentary. So, of course, uh, before doing something, I really love to be informed. Uh, sometimes I don't need to be informed because I'm an insider of many stories and they are a part of my life. But by the way, I will try also to have uh, uh, the most wide uh, uh, knowledge about what I'm going to tell and uh, what I'm going to produce. And this is my first word and this is very meticulous. Meticulous is also the, the work of uh, casting to select uh, uh, stories uh, because it's not only based on the potential impact of the personal stories but it's also based on uh, analyzing the visual aspect of the people uh, if uh, because you can have a great stories but maybe it's basically you are shine so if I bring you the camera uh, you will not talk uh, or you will not talk uh, if I switch off the camera and so it's unfortunately uh, not uh, for me useful um, so there is a, a huge work of selection. Then there is a work, a work of responsibility. I made a documentary in which I interview asking before if they were sure. And even they told me, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm referring to a documentary in which I interview people without sitting jeep. So people who were risking to be maybe denounced or to be deported or whatever. Even they say to me, I want to be a part of this documentary because I was. So there was a, a, a work as a, a old uncle of them to say, okay, uh, maybe in your case, I can interview because I like it. Uh, or in your case, I really love your, 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 your interview, your story, but I think that I will put you at risk uh, uh, if I will put in my documentaries because maybe your background, is, it's, uh, it's not only that you don't have the citizenship, you could have something that maybe they can uh, uh, really have an escalation uh, against you. So um, it, it, there is a part of responsibility and the other uh, that is very meticulous, so it's not uh, creative or artistic, uh, is uh, uh, how can I balance my story if, uh, um, because unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, I'm not living only in a unique place. Uh, I'm, I live in a different part of, of the world and I travel a lot of part of the world. And so I really aware how you can, uh, uh, even your story is unique, is original, is from Italy or a small town of Italy. How can I um, create empathy with someone who is living in Rio de Janeiro or in New York or in Chicago? Uh, so now that I learned much, much more better this process to translate also <laughs> the visual culture uh, experience, uh, I, I'm much more comfortable. But this is a meticulous uh, work. I never want to share because I don't want to create controversy, but there was a, also a, an advertisement in the 80s of Oliviero Toscani, a great artist and great photographer of um, a black woman, a naked black woman who was giving milk to a kids. Uh, of course, in the culture representation as uh, Italian, I don't know Europeans, it's uh, it's not uh, uh, a tough image or racist image or whatever. If I bring uh, this image in United States, uh, it, it's considered racist because uh, actually uh, where the slave owner to give their kids uh, to um, 
the female slave to, to have milk. Uh, in fact, this campaign was a, a campaign at the time that was uh, not promoting the United States because there were a lot of protests. So, of course, uh, uh, having uh, the, the, um, the mood uh, and the fortune to uh, understand the different uh, gap, cultural gap, or some of them, because uh, I'm not a, an expert of uh, everything, but uh, I can definitely give uh, a different way also to um, uh, represent and talk to Italy uh, for delicate uh, topics uh, in which people can understand much more better. Otherwise, uh, in Italy, I think in every country, we have the tendency uh, to also in the creative process uh, to thinking uh, uh, just uh, for what we have seen uh, in our neighborhood uh, or, or country. And, uh, and sometimes what comes from outside could be also useful to understand much more better about our situation. So it could be much more objective. So creativity uh, is the, the most part of creativity in my work is maybe during the post-production in which you have the freedom to, to keep uh, different, especially in a documentary based on interview, I have the freedom to select uh, the word, the frames, uh, the footage, uh, the historical stills, uh, there is much more freedom. Thanks. And this is what was really the focus of my next question for you, this constant work of translation across different contexts. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about it, because then different contexts have different histories of racism, as you were saying, no, and different geopolitical connections. So I wanted to ask you also how you work across these different locales, uh, also through language. While preparing for this talk, we were commenting, or I was asking you, right, about the issue of the word race, which for those who might be familiar with the US context but do not speak Italian, they might know that, they might not know that it's a bit of a taboo uh, word that uh, people of uh, our generations were not absolutely prohibited from using. And so, and you had a particular take on that. So I wanted to ask you about these sort of how to work across these subtleties also through language and also through different histories, because again, um, a lot of the Afro-descendant communities uh, in Italy might be coming uh, from a different history of migration, of movement, of labor that is not necessarily the same as for instance, the, the communities in the United States. So now that you work across, how are you navigating also these specificities somewhat? Yeah, uh, it's something that um, I always navigated uh, since I came to US to show my first documentary inside Buffalo, especially inside Buffalo has been a lot of viewing, not only government viewing, Pentagon and Library of Congress, but also a lot of uh, uh, African-American association or uh, civil rights movement association. So where there were a lot of uh, African-Americans in the audience and as organizer. And always I had this question, there is racism in Italy or whatever. Um, there are black Italians or, uh, so this is uh, um, um, the first question because of course in uh, the American culture and paradigm, uh, race uh, played uh, an important role. United States has been founded on racism, bringing slave to build America, basically, so as a labor force. Uh, so African-American and slaves were in United States since the foundation of United States, not uh, they didn't came after. Uh, in Italy, it's different. There is, uh, as I try to show you tonight, uh, there is a part of the history in which there were black people. <laughs> Uh, in many cases were not mentioned because during the Roman Empire there was not the tradition to uh, define people by color, but there were a lot of Africans. Uh, the legions of the Roman Empire were multi-ethnic and were deployed all around the Roman Empire to, to fight. And sometimes uh, they settled in some places. Uh, as I tried to explain before, there were uh, sometimes uh, diplomatic travel from kings of Ethiopia to the Vatican or other Republic of Venice. Uh, so there were a circulation that was not only about slave. Then when there was the slavery, uh, Italy didn't have slaves. Uh, even of course the approval of slavery came from Italy because uh, 
before starting uh, slavery, Portuguese uh, that were Catholic needed to ask, uh, of course, to the Vatican if it was possible to enslave Africans. But by the way, Italy didn't have this kind of experience. And there was a skip uh, straight to the colonialism. So it was from the end of 19th century that uh, to align uh, at the same uh, European paradigm about uh, white superiority, also Italians, uh, to construct the idea of the unification of Italy, but also uh, to create and prepare the terrain for the invasion of uh, the colonies, uh, they create and they really promote uh, a racist culture. And so this is, was the moment in which uh, racism, not only in, in, in a in institutional way, but also as a culture, uh, started to become a part of uh, the cultural uh, composition of the nation and was something that was not defeated by the end of uh, the fascist regime because also in the mm. Democratic Republic of Italy there were uh, racist images or mistakes or whatever for decades because if I'm a kid of six years old uh, in the 20s in the 45 I'm simply uh, 27 in the 80s uh, I, I was 70 years old so and this kind of people were in position of many things uh, magazine journals uh, politics uh, or whatever so even they were not uh, define themselves as explicitly racist, uh, like uh, an alt-right party or something like that, uh, it was the culture. It doesn't matter. Maybe many of them were also democratic or communist, but this is, doesn't matter that the, the, the culture was not uh, uh, racist. Thanks. And I encourage also everybody to really get to see your other documentary, which you referenced, uh, 18 News Soli, because I think it portrays very interestingly this yeah. notion that really believes to not be a racist country, but um, facts and even just uh, cultural manifestations probably contradict that pretty heavily. We're getting a flurry of questions, so I'm going to mm -hmm. cut sure. and start asking. Um, some are just really pretty factual, and um, some um, someone was asking um, what you were addressing now, which is um, uh, what are immigration was the primary way in which uh, black people of African descent came to Italy and they're also asking what percentage of the Italian population is black and whether there are anti-discrimination laws in Italy. Yeah, so the percentage uh, based on, uh, unfortunately in Italy we have don't, we don't have a, a statistic census based on race, so it's very difficult sometimes to quantify the real number of uh, uh, African descent in Italy. But uh, there is an estimation that uh, are around uh, 800,000. Uh, 400,000 came in the last uh, uh, seven years. Uh, uh, most of them were refugees and the other uh, came from uh, the 80s. Uh, but then it's difficult because at the same time we have a lot of Italian citizens who are African descent, but we can uh, know so because if you are Italian, by the way, there is any uh, box uh, in which you have uh, uh, to, uh, to to write your race. Um, so this is an estimation. Then we have the estimation of the number of thousands of people who were adopted since the 60s uh, from Brazil, uh, 80. Um, so it's a, it's a community that uh, it should be around, uh, I think, uh, maybe the one maybe the one percent of uh, the the population. And I'm referring uh, uh, to those who are uh, um, African descent from Sub-Sahara because uh, uh, otherwise we have uh, 700,000 people from North Africa, in particular from Morocco and Tunisia, uh, that we also can, uh, but they are a part of the African continent, so politically they are, they are Africans. And um, the other uh, thing is that uh, so it's very problematic to have a census. Uh, and I forgot, sorry, the... the... What are there anti-discrimination laws in Italy? Oh, the laws, yeah. The law, uh, it's, uh, it's a process of discrimination because we have, uh, um, unfortunately, first of all, by the way, we have a different process uh, in Italy to naturalize. So the naturalization law is very difficult. Uh, even they say that uh, if you reside in the country with uh, as a resident since 10 years, you can apply for uh, naturalize. It's very difficult to naturalize in, in Italy. That's why uh, 
the generation Balotelli, that is the generation born uh, uh, during the 90s, and most of them are not Italian because their parents have difficulties uh, to naturalize. Uh, they were born in Italy, but the Italian citizenship law don't allow to become Italian when you are born. You have to wait 18 years old. Uh, otherwise, if your parents become uh, naturalized before you are 18, uh, automatically they can transfer you uh, the citizenship. But that's never happened for the, the parents. So a lot of kids, uh, when they were 18 years old, uh, they applied for the citizenship, but not all of them received the citizenship. Uh, so, of course, uh, this kind of mechanism, uh, it's very weird. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Italy is inside the European Union. Uh, and in the European Union, there are countries who are allowed to become citizens if you are born in the country. So it's a mechanism that, unfortunately, it's very weird also for the fact that uh, technically we have the Schengen passport, uh, but other people and people who are born by immigrants in other country have the Schengen passport. Uh, those who are born in Italy, no. So it's, it's very, it's very weird. And uh, someone else is asking whether, well, they were asking about this uh, citizenship law. So I think you answered that as well. And someone was asking whether there have been initiatives uh, such as uh, decolonizing, so to say, the curriculum in Italian universities. And whether there have been, whether you know, um, whether that reception um, has been positive mm -hmm. or what kind of reception has there been in Italy? But uh, first of all, before uh, starting this process, it is very difficult. And uh, of course, the colonized academy is a concept that is much more wider than, uh, say, uh, bringing diver it's much more bringing diversity in the curricula. So trying to find uh, if there are also uh, diverse researchers, diverse uh, faculty. Um, and also, by the way, the, the 80 percent of the academia, by the way, even is, is, a, is a university in Africa is a Western based uh, school format. So um, also the other continent, maybe Asia, no, but Africa or South America needs to, to do more uh, to bring their own anthropology also in the curricula. Uh, besides that, uh, by the way, um, the, the work that many other people are doing is, by the way, to create a contest in which uh, at least in Italy, uh, especially the colonial past or something about diversity also, the past of diversity in Italy, uh, need to be told and need to be told, included all the stories. Uh, and possibly, uh, this is also a global discussion that I have uh, in different uh, scenarios, uh, but uh, um, in Italy, in, history, in Italian history, we have a lot of examples where diverse. The only problem is that when we teach uh, this uh, stories uh, we use the latin name of some people so uh, or the italian uh, translated the latin name of the people and we didn't know or we didn't remember uh, that maybe this person like uh, i make an example caracal was mixed raised and uh, the emperor caracal of the and his father settimo severo came from libya and we have a lot of example and stories of people who were not uh, when we use uh, also the word Jesu, maybe many people uh, assume that he was European and, uh, and we don't use his Hebrew name. And this uh, works for everything. So of course, in a country like Italy, that was a melting pot for 17 or 18 centuries. Uh, if you are much more focused sometimes uh, uh, to explain much more the background of many things uh, that just you are telling in the curricula, you automatically uh, educate people to say, oh, wow, I came from a country that uh, it, it was diverse uh, uh, many years before other countries like Canada or United States. Uh, and so this is the paradox. This is a, a territory that uh, has been used to be diverse, has been used as a, sometimes to don't question about uh, uh, ethnicity, but uh, it's a country that uh, since maybe a century became uh, uh, a country with a lot of stereotypes and a country who image itself uh, as a, a homogeneous uh, ethnic uh, group uh, uh, that is unbelievable because uh, if we're gonna trace the DNA of the Italians, the 70% of the results uh, is from different places of Europe, North Africa, Middle East. And, uh... Thanks, Fred. And following up, I guess, on this notion, someone is mentioning a historian Alessandro Triulzi, who says that contemporary Italian racism is the result of a structural perception system caused by the removal of the colonist memory 
that emerges in crisis situations. And so they're asking whether you would agree with this statement and also how you would argument the substantial silence of Italian artists regarding colonialism. Yeah, no, this is, uh, Triuzzi is one of uh, the most interesting uh, historians. And there are a lot of, uh, I, of course, uh, today I, I really go quick and I try to, to bring some clips, uh, but there are a lot of historians and, uh, and the scholars who are really uh, working on post-colonial studies. Uh, and really, it, it, it's, a, it's a, actually, it's a matter of fact that it's a group that is increasing a lot in the last uh, five years. Uh, and I'm very happy that they have much more opportunity also to bring uh, into university uh, and the academic context. Of course, it's much more difficult uh, the work that we need to address to the high school or middle school. So starting from uh, uh, the first grade of uh, the education that is much more uh, important. Uh, and um, there is, um, I think there is a silence of many people uh, uh, about that. and. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's a silence. First of all, there is, of course, a, a, a silence of um, the generation of my parents, because this was a generation that uh, tried to uh, define and think about this past as, uh, first of all, they decorate the past with the classic slogan, uh, Italiani brava gente, we, we are good, decent people, because uh, we didn't enslave uh, uh, like uh, other the British or the French, or actually uh, there are a lot of things that are in the archives, but there are a lot of stories about rapes. Uh, uh, an officer, Rodolfo Graziani, has been charged by the United Nations after World War II for war crimes because he used gas that were banned by the United Nations to kill a civilian in Ethiopia. Uh, but the fact that Italy was uh, a country that was really important, strategic important for the North Atlantic uh, ally was the reason why after World War II, very few people were charged by the United Nations for war crimes because Italy was important uh, for the strategy against Russia. And so, of course, many, many of these crimes and many of uh, uh, the worst things that uh, Italians made were uh, put in a box. And actually, Italy made this stuff uh, with just seven, eight years of experience of colonialism, and they use gas ban, gas that were banned. So I could not imagine what they were able to do if <laughs> they we won the war and they were able to. Um, so first of all, was uh, um, an amnesia of uh, or uh, a fake amnesia of the generation of my parents. Uh, uh, and then, of course, also the media didn't uh, didn't try to tell a story about that because many people in charge of the media, by the way, came from this past, and uh, and so it's sort of uh, skip. They skip simply forty years of experience. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, um, when I I really engage in a lot of uh, uh, black conversation in African American uh, studies department or or African-American Association um, the, of the Black Diaspora, the Global Black Diaspora. And of course, uh, uh, when you don't have a huge resistance also to remember your history, it's also difficult to bring this conversation. So the other problem of Italy is uh, that we don't have only um, African-Italian who are from Ethiopia or Eritrea or Libya. Actually, they represent maybe there are 40,000 in total. Uh, the Nigerian community is much more wider than all the East African community in Italy. So why the other country like United Kingdom, I'm thinking, and, and France have a lot of debate because the people from the farmer colonies came to live in their country and they remember things, they bring things to the attention. We didn't have the same. So even you are African Italian descent, and but you are like me from Ghana, maybe you didn't know nothing from uh, uh, from uh, the past, because uh, the Italian education contents will not give you not the instrument. But at the same time, also your own country didn't know nothing, because in Ghana we don't. Maybe we know something about Ethiopia, but uh, the, the Ghana experience was much more connected to the British. So it's much more difficult, also for this reason. Now I think social media, like I put in a slide, they are creating a, a great connection, great stories to spread much more. Uh, untold stories and to talk much more better about that and also the 
the inspiration that we had from different countries, particularly this moment last summer. So the, the idea to uh, interrogate and question ourselves uh, about the meaning of monuments, the meaning of things that are celebrating uh, uh, a worst time of uh, the history of races, uh, I think that uh, we are brief also in Italy this kind of atmosphere. And so this is very contagious and hopefully will bring uh, into a conversation. Thanks, Fred. And yes, you mentioned elsewhere also the fact that uh, in our, when we grew up in schools, there was just a little paragraph on history books. Yeah. But now we know that it is our, our duty also to educate ourselves. It's not just something that needs to be given to us. It's something that we need to um, yeah. develop awareness on. Someone else is, uh, um, writes, being American born and raised in my 60s, I grew up in a deeply systematically racist culture and society. I'm wondering how the white Italians respond to what I would consider a new integration of people of color in Italian society. And what about the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, the integration is a difficult process uh, because uh, uh, I think there is also a lack of um, strategy. So it's not only just the wilderness or no, but also the, the strategy. So Italy, of course, is different from the United States as a country, as a country in which uh, uh, when we talk about particularly immigration, uh, by the way, no profit or NGO, uh, they play a role, uh, but there is any direction or uh, institutional uh, um, strong uh, support while in other countries there are a national agency of immigration and all the process uh, to be immigrant, uh, the visa uh, and many other things are managed by this kind of agency. So, um, and also there is uh, still the idea that uh, immigrants, uh, and this is the, the sad thing for me, it's also the word. So I, I, for many years, uh, uh, I also when I talk about my dad, uh, say, "Oh, he's an immigrant." Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it's different between it's very different uh, from me. Or, but now that I'm immigrant too, so I went uh, to live in the United States. Uh, uh, first of all, I really I really admire people uh, who are doing efforts uh, to make uh, better lives uh, in an environment that is not their own environment. And now I am understanding a lot of things. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, and I think much more that this world need to be uh, in one sense, uh, um, need to be addressed with a positive uh, meanings, uh, with a uh, maybe positive work uh, so we maybe we need to work much more better because uh, i can tolerate that uh, if you google uh, uh migrant on google italy images uh, you have only imaging on african uh, actually uh, boot people so who are coming from the sea on the boot uh, while my dad came with an airplane but there are still now a lot of africans immigrants who are coming with uh, an airplane not only with boots uh, and it's the same united states when you google a migrant you see a lot of uh, uh, latin american mexican american at the border who are coming uh, walking on the border <laughs> like uh, so it's a, it's a shame that, that we uh, are giving to this world uh, only these uh, these meanings. Uh, so the, the the work of immigration in Italy it's uh, it's uh, it's a huge work. And about uh, BLM Italy, it's uh, it's raising uh, it's raising a lot. Uh, um, of course, we like United States uh, had some historical association. They are still uh, active and present. But I can deny that for the young generation, especially after what happened last year in the United States and the exposure that BLM has globally, not only uh, in Italy, also in Italy, we have people who want to refer when they are talking about racism or how to empower the black community uh, with uh, uh, the slogan uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter. But it's the same in Brazil. Even in Brazil, they have a lot of historical important association of Brasileiro. Now BLM uh, is a sort of brand is a sort of slogan also outside the United States. Thanks, Fred. So I think we will wrap up. We just got a comment also mentioning that the images of historical figures that you showed reminded mm -hmm. everyone who was watching about the work also that Kehinde Wiley is doing with African-American figures, sort of placing them in position of 
power and dignity, no, which is what you were saying before, sort of the word the immigrant is stripped of dignity and um, Kehinde somewhat does the opposite, no, the reverse. Yeah. And so they were sort of underlining how much they appreciated this clip that you showed us. And then the very last question is someone asking uh, whether you could share the best way to get in touch with you so as to learn more about your projects. Uh, if you have a chance, uh, uh, this is something that we started to do right now. Last week, we launched uh, um, this, uh, this year, so uh, blackitalia.info. Um, it's a platform with the intent to create uh, more clips about uh, historical clips. Uh, so you can find other historical clips. You can find uh, the clips of the episode of the web doc series Blackit. Uh, and uh, you will find uh, also some uh, episode about uh, Black History Month. Uh, so Black History, uh, we will try to explain much more things in Italy about uh, African-American history and to tell much more wider the story of some uh, uh, Black Italians in the history. And there is an episode that is very nice about Leona Jakovacci that was a boxer, a mixed race boxer. Uh, who came in, into Italy when he was uh, three years old, uh, he raised in Viterbo, and then when he was 16, he moved to um, Europe in the United Kingdom because uh, Italy was a very difficult time for him. And uh, if he acted like uh, being an African-American, so he changed his name in John Douglas Walker, then he became a boxer. Uh, then he, he went to Paris and to France to fight a uh, boxing championship and he came back to Italy when he was 25 saying that my name is Leone Jacovacci, I'm Italian, then he uh, became also Italian champion and this is a great, uh, one of the great story because of course there are a lot of I think people that can identify themselves with uh, this story and actually I think it will be also a movie uh, so we hope that uh, they will release a movie and uh, has a great potential as a story. Fred, thanks so much. This was wonderful. Thank I really you. hope people will send you questions or also sure. through the you Latino know, network, really to keep the conversation going. So thank you. Thanks to everybody who's been watching this. And just to remind that the conversation will be available online after if anybody wants to rewatch or share. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>